It's nice spring weather here today. How's it up there, Zilla? It stopped raining. I had two days oh. of rain, which was really um, lovely, but um, a bit intense after the first few hours. <laughs> Didn't stop. Mm. No, it, it'll green it up a bit because it has gotten pretty dry. Yeah. Lovely. Thought. It dries mm. out there quickly, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah, it does. Yeah. Nice weather still, though. Not too hot. Okay, you're on. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Silla Lyons. I'm based in Townsville office in North Queensland. I'd like to introduce you to Sonia White, our financial planner. Um, Sonia is based in Brisbane uh, and moves around uh, many areas of Queensland and other states. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to do uh, an, a talk on retirement planning. Um, we're going to have, yeah. We're going to have a chat room facility where people could put in questions. We'll answer questions towards the end. Um, and if, if perchance we don't get time to do all the questions, we will respond to those uh, after the seminar and uh, we'll respond either in writing or your local manager uh, will give you a call for your area. So, um, the first item is the welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. We have a disclaimer here and the disclaimer is actually to tell you that in our presentations, you'll receive general information only and education. You do not get advice. Advice comes in the form uh, it's written and it comes through our licensed financial planners such as Sonia here or the team that we have um, throughout Australia and in head office. So everything today may fit your circumstances, may not, but please do not take it as personal advice. Okay, our retirement goals. Sonia, you deal with a lot of potential retirees. So um, can you just talk to this slide for a second? Absolutely. Thanks, Zilla. Um, one, given it's a retirement seminar, uh, it's um, important uh, that when people ask me that most common question, when can I afford to retire or uh, what age can I retire, that we, we have a look at uh, the things that influence uh, the answers. So that it comes down to what is your starting balance in retirement? Uh, what returns are you getting? How much are you going to spend? Uh, those sort of things. And the question, how much do you need to live on or how much are you going to spend is influenced by your goals. Uh, you can understand that if, if you're going to go cruising six months of every year, you're going to have a different budget to somebody who's going camping or glamping. Uh, with, with the answers uh, uh, to those questions, we're going to, we can't answer them generally because there's, there's not one situation fits every, or one answer fits everybody. So we're going to have a look at the sorts of things to consider uh, when you're retiring to help you, to help you uh, understand if uh, your budget's affordable and when can you retire. So as far as the amount of money people do ask you that question. Um, how much money do I need to retire on? Can I stop work tomorrow? Whatever. Um, can you address these uh, modest and comfortable lifestyle uh, indications, I suppose they are, of the amount of money people spend in a year, um, according to the Association of Super Funds of Australia, who do a... Um, or calculation regularly to work out income levels. So, Sonia, what, what uh, do you notice about these particular indicators? Well, as for has benchmarked uh, individuals and couples around Australia and looked at their annual budgets, they uh, change depending what kind of lifestyle you have. And you can actually drill down on the website as to the definitions of modest versus comfortable. What we know is that uh, the age pension, uh, whilst it's, it's a generous 
uh, social security system we have in Australia, uh, it's hard for people to meet all their uh, costs of living on the age pension. Occasionally, I find somebody that might be able to save when they're on the full age pension, but uh, typically, people are modest or comfortable in their lifestyles. Uh, the important thing about these figures, though, they assume that people have paid off their mortgage and do not have rent. So if you still have debt or rent to pay, your cost of living are going to be higher than this. Hmm. And, and for those who do own their own home, um, when you compare on this slide, say, a modest lifestyle, uh, for a single person, it's it's not much more than the age pension, is it, if they get the full age pension? So, you know, it's, it, it does give you some comfort that uh, you're not going to live in poverty um, necessarily because uh, you can afford a modest lifestyle um, with very little savings, I suppose. Correct. Having that extra 4000 odd per annum, uh, gives you more flexibility and it doesn't require a big asset base mm. to fund it. Mm. Mm. Uh, we also uh, know that there's a bit of fear mongering out there. Uh, people mm. will read that they need a million dollars to retire yeah. on and it's simply not the case. No, no. And people who don't have a lot of capital but do own their own home, there's other options as well, as you'd well know with Centrelink as far as pension loan scheme, isn't there, which you might mention when we do the Centrelink component of it, to give people a little bit more uh, capital during their uh, retirement periods if they if they need it for family or personal reasons. Yes. So the comfortable lifestyle, there is uh, information, as you said, on the ASPA website. And this slide is very difficult to read at the moment because there's too much written on it, but it is repeated on our website. Um, it's on the ASPA red website, sorry. And it distinguishes between the comfortable, the modest, and the age pension as far as uh, the spending requirements go. Uh, for, as an example, um, a comfortable retirement, the indication may be when you have a meal out, it's in a reasonably nice restaurant, whereas a modest retirement, you may be actually looking more towards eating in a club, um, that sort of uh, comparison. Modest holiday, maybe around Australia, a comfortable one, maybe overseas. Yes, yeah. everyone's got different preferences anyway, and some people um, prefer to live modestly than um, comfortably, even if they have got a lot more money. So that would be that you can drill down with this and find more information on the ASPA website. Um, so your financial situation um, when you're looking at people, Sonia, you look at a number of different aspects. Can you go through that a little bit? Correct. Uh, super is one option, but it's not necessarily the only option. If people have investments outside of super, uh, we compare and contrast them as sources of retirement income. Uh, why is the family house there? Well, uh, as you mentioned before, Zilla, it can be a source of equity. Whilst it would often be the last resort, perhaps somebody is going to downsize, and we'll talk about the downsizer contribution later, but perhaps they're going to free up capital by moving to something less expensive, or there are reverse mortgages, or there are uh, the Centrelink uh, pension loan scheme, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and just while we're on that topic, uh, that pension loan scheme has uh, proposed to change so that people don't only get an extra 50% of their age pension, they could actually access lump sums uh, from Centrelink mm -hmm. and that, that reduces the equity in their home if, if they sell the house or uh, they pass away, uh, it has to be squared up with Centrelink. But mm -hmm. uh, for those uh, with limited resources elsewhere, it's an option uh, which we can compare and contrast to other mm -hmm. sources. Uh, super though is an increasingly important asset for people is where most people I see have a predominant amount of money. Mm. Uh, and per perhaps uh, we can uh, look at whether that's, that's the best situation for them. Uh, but as we'll come to see uh, as a retirement vehicle, super uh, 
trumps most other things. Yeah, it does get a lot of um, tax benefits, especially. And that's the next slide. <laughs> so um, in our um, super Excel, uh, earnings are taxed up to 15%. Uh, they're also taxed up to 15% inside the transition to retirement pension, whereas the allocated pension, which is more considered a retirement um, vehicle, uh, the purse where you draw money out of once you're in retirement, the earnings are not taxed at all. They're given a great concession uh, by the government in that uh, if you had the money in the bank, you'd be paying it at your marginal tax rate. Um, but allocated pensions, inside the allocated pension, there's no tax on earnings. So they can earn a little more than your super account in the same investment option, mainly because of that tax consequence. Um, I suppose funding new retirement, um, these different age groups relate to uh, particular access. Um, and Sonia, a little bit um, about the three different groups there, if you like. Yes, uh, the age uh, 58 to 59 uh, was broader. It's narrowing down uh, over time and will be eliminated altogether within the next couple of years. Essentially, what this refers to is preservation age. And it depends on the year you were born, and it allows you to access your super if you've met a condition of release. Uh, if you haven't met a condition of uh, release, you do have the ability to start a transition to retirement pension from that age. 60 to 64 is uh, a similar situation, although we now add uh, a new retirement definition for that age group, and I'll go through that in a short while. Uh, the important thing about 60 onwards is that you can access your super tax free once you've met a condition of release. So it's the taxation uh, on the amounts paid to you that changes once you're 60. We say Somebody, 60 is the golden age for super. It's fantastic. So uh, sometimes we uh, can see that people can benefit from starting a transition to retirement pension, even if they haven't met a condition of release. Uh, simply because they're able to use that money uh, to do some strategy, whether that's paying off a mortgage faster or recycling it in as a, a salary sacrifice so you get overall tax savings, or maybe it's uh, putting it back in to reduce death benefits tax. Uh, but importantly, uh, from age 58, depending on what year you're born, those people could start a transition to retirement pension if they wanted to. And if they had no other income, they could access up to say $45,000 a year by virtue of the rebates, it would be tax-free. Mm -hmm. uh, age 60 to 64, um, if we look at the condition of release there, um, you can either meet the full retirement definition, which is that you have uh, no longer intended to work 10 hours or more per week. Mm -hmm. That, um, that doesn't mean you can't change your mind later, but it is at that point in time, you have that intention to not and work. You Anything would have terminated too, wouldn't you? Uh, with, you with would. That. Yeah, two have, months to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have all your leave paid out. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, the second uh, part of that definition from age 60 uh, mm -hmm. onwards, you just have to cease a gainful employment arrangement and you've met that condition of release. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be beneficial for those who change jobs. Suddenly they have access to their super and uh, perhaps they can get some tax savings on the earnings that you mentioned, Zilla. So mm -hmm. instead of paying 15% tax on earnings, you could go to zero tax on earnings by starting an account-based pension. Thinking back to um, you know my old days as a chalky, um, uh, now more technologically advanced with whiteboards, but um, age 60 to 64, a lot of teachers in the old days used to supervise students and um, uh, you were, you know, rewarded for that. Um, if you terminated from that sort of arrangement, would that be enough of a termination? Because uh, to... to uh, 
satisfy that changing um, employment status? If it's gainful employment and there's income mm -hmm. that you can put in your tax return mm -hmm. and it was officially done, then you, uh, as long as it's not contrived, uh, it would be a termination. Mm -hmm. So yes, a, or somebody with two jobs can cease yeah. their second yeah. job. Working in the so morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, once you get to 65, uh, whether you're working or not, that is a condition of release. So uh, the 60 to 65 age group, uh, that even if you're not contemplating retirement yet, there's still some wonderful strategy we can do for you uh, to put you in a better position and make your own money last longer. Hmm. So somebody over who's reached 65 can access their super whether they're working or not. Correct. Say a, a um, low income earner may want to um, gain some, you know, the uh, government co contribution. They need to find the thousand dollars to put in, uh, quite possibly, I suppose. If they've got access, um, they might be able to uh, access a thousand dollars and put it back in there and gain 500 from the government, perhaps. Lots of different strategies, I suppose, you see along the way. Sonia. Um, summary sacrifice. I suppose most people listening today would understand salary sacrifice uh, in that you get tax savings for contributing to super from your salary by bypassing the ATO as such and putting your money straight into the super vehicle where it loses 15% on contributions tax rather than being taxed at your marginal tax rate. So um, these are the various tax rates. The 15% um, refers to incomes up to that 180,000. Um, after 180,000, they go to 30%, don't they, uh, for the contributions tax? For the savings, yes. Yes. So your 45% marginal rate is uh, no longer applicable to the what you salary sacrifice, only the 15% contribution tax. So a 30% saving uh, is instant. You don't have to wait until you lodge a tax return. It's instant in that pay packet. Uh, there's no investment that I can recommend that's going to earn 30% on a regular basis like that. So it's very strong. Uh, the other... Uh, Really, anything over 18,000 uh, with your 19% or 32%, there are some tax savings. Uh, the only time that you'll be worse off is if your uh, accessible income is less than the threshold. Yep. So okay. you'll actually be worse off by salary sacrificing pre-tax uh, because your marginal tax rate was zero anyway. So why pay the 15% contributions tax? Yeah. For those, for those people living uh, in Queensland or with an EBA that uh, gives them uh, incentive to salary sacrifice and they still want to do it, or if you want to get the co-contribution, you can do a post-tax salary sacrifice as well. So whilst you're not saving your marginal tax, uh, it goes into the fund tax free. Yeah. And I suppose we, those tax rates, the marginal tax rates, um, exclude the Medicare levy that people com commonly pay, the 2% Medicare levy. Correct. Uh -huh. There's an example of, of salary sacrifice. Um, do you want to quickly go through that one, um, Sonia? I don't think we need to spend too much time on it. Most people who are looking towards their retirement have probably been contributing a little bit. Uh, it, it becomes more attractive as you get older, of course. Um, you watch your balance a little bit more. Um, right. But even 5% can make a significant difference over time with the compounding earnings. Uh, whilst you're young, you might have competing interests like the mortgage, but uh, perhaps squaring on a little bit away, um, which you won't hardly notice, because you can see there, um, salary sacrificing $192 only makes a difference of 127 in the pay packet. And that can build up significantly over time. Uh, once you get closer to preservation age and that more uh, accessibility options, uh, then uh, the, that, that could be increased. Uh, or if you want to reduce your tax prior to that, uh, of course, uh, you've, 
as long as you're under the concessional contribution cap, you can mm -hmm. put in um, uh, an amount that um, you, you know you're comfortable putting in from a cash flow perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, if the income is over two hundred and fifty thousand for the high income earners, they will pay more than fifteen percent contributions tax on it. They're going to pay the thirty percent, which is to even up, I suppose, the benefits a little bit. Um, but still. It's, they're still making savings regardless because they're not paying tax at their top tax rate. Um, so salary sacrifice is very attractive. And I suppose people who are over 65 and still working, um, even more accessible to them because if they ran short of capital because they are salary sacrificing, they've always got the ability to access a little bit for um, any capital needs, I suppose, hmm. um, that may arise in their working uh, while they're still working. Um, concessional contribution limits, we've moved up a little bit. They're leaving a little bit more of money that people are allowed to put into super. We can now put in concessionally, which is where somebody gets a tax concession, such as the individual with salary sacrifice, the employer with employer contributions or any employer additional they give, such as through an EB award. Um, super guarantee, of course, which is the employer contribution um, that they're obliged to put in, 10%. Um, and individuals can also, apart from salary sacrificing, they can make deductible contributions where they put in a lump sum and claim a tax deduction. As long as all of these stay within that figure of 27,500. Can you explain um, the circumstances where you may be able to go and put a little bit more in on a concessional basis, Sonia? Yes, absolutely. We have a range of situations. Uh, it might be that somebody's working casually and they don't know what their income is going to be for the year. So they don't know by how much they're going to benefit from a uh, salary sacrifice. So instead, what they could do is wait until closer to the 30th of June. And uh, we have much more um, information about their accessible income then. And they could drop in a, a personal deductible contribution. Once upon a time, you could only do that if um, you didn't have employer support, but now the two are available together so that you can make up the difference at the last moment if you wish. The other option is uh, to be putting in regular post-tax contributions. Uh, and then once you know your accessible income, you could uh, then provide the fund with a notice and say you're going to claim those contributions on your tax. It's very important to make sure you notify the fund of that before you lodge a tax return. Uh, so if you have any questions, talk to your accountant or talk to an advisor here about that. Um, but you can go onto the MyGov website and see um, you know, a lot of valuable information. Uh, when you're there, you may also be able to see your total super balance. So, uh, there's another really great rule that's only just come in since the 2019 year, and, and that's if you have uh, total super balances uh, add up to less than 500000 on the prior 30th of June, you're able to carry forward some concessional contribution cap. So uh, this enables you to use more than the 27,500 potentially if you haven't used up the 25,000 in the prior years. Mm. Uh, whether that's a good idea or not uh, depends on, uh, of course, your accessible income. I have uh, sometimes deliberately not used all the cap this mm. year and saved it for the next year because somebody's gonna have a, a capital gain come along from sale of a property mm. uh, or sale of investments. Uh, but for other people, we're seeing some uh, quite big tax deductions. And it might make sense if you're close to that 500,000, uh, you might want to use your carry forward contributions uh, mm -hmm. before you lose that ability. Uh, if you don't have the, the capital to make that contribution, there could be a round robin available to you by starting a transition to retirement pension. Uh, 
So uh, some exciting, exciting ways to save tax. And I do get very excited if I can save people tax. That's my background. Uh, so uh, yes, I encourage people to, to make use of these rules while they're there. Yeah, I'm very good. Um, also, uh, the after-tax contribution limits went up this year, and instead of the one hundred thousand, we've gone up to the hundred and ten thousand, um, which is a significant amount of money that people are allowed to put into super. Uh, people under sixty-seven can access the bring forward rule, which is if they have a windfall or an inheritance or something to that effect, they can put in up to three three years worth uh, over the period or in one go and then not put anything in for the next two years. Mm. Um, that's if they are the last year they could do it, Sonia. Would that be when they're 67? Um, a turn, uh, sorry, 66? on the 1st of July. Uh, so they could still put it in that financial year, couldn't they trigger the bring forward rule? Yes, exactly right. Uh, okay. So it, it's uh, 1st of July test. Uh, but if you're going to wait until after you're 67, even if you were 66 on the 1st of July, you must have met a work test in that year. Uh, so these are there's two changes there. Not only has their cap gone up in dollar amounts, but uh, in, instead of 65 being the cutoff point, it's now 67. So uh, we're just hoping that after the, the budget announcements, perhaps that could even be extended to age 75. But uh, even if that's legislated, it's in the future. So taking advantage of these uh, rules while you can um, is a good idea. And is it possible to ever trigger the bring forward rule twice? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Well, uh, commonly do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Subject to, I suppose, the limit that you're allowed to get into super these days on an after-tax basis in total, I suppose. Um, I noticed there that uh, you mentioned the work test. You have to have worked 40 hours in a consecutive 30-day period if you're between 67 and, and 74 or, you know, up to age 75. Um, 75 and over, no further contributions. They mean personal contributions, don't they? If you were still employed and you were 77 um, and, say, you were driving the school bus, hopefully quite alert, um, <laughs> you could <My> still <laughs> get the employer, could still pay you the uh, mandated uh, SG that, is required. It's just you wouldn't be able to put in extra yourself. Precisely, mm -hmm. precisely. Okay. Um, other ways to contribute. You mentioned this downsizer before. It doesn't have an age on that um, slide there. Uh, can you give us a little bit of information on that, uh, Sonia? Yes, Zilla. Under the current rules, uh, if you're 65 or over and you sell a residence uh, that you've owned for 10 years or more, and it's partially or fully exempt from capital gains tax, uh, which it will be if you've lived in there, uh, then you're able to use the downsizer rule to put in up to 300,000 or the proceeds of sale. So if you only sold a, a property for 250,000, that is the maximum you can put in. Uh, if you sell a property uh, as a couple, that gives you 600,000 to, to put into super and uh, even if uh, that is not money that you've released, uh, there could be some strategy around still putting in that amount and washing away some death benefits tax. Uh, so for pe people that uh, aren't sure what death benefits tax is, well, you won't find that terminology in the legislation, but it is tax that comes uh, or becomes payable when ultimately your money goes to non-dependents such as adult children. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are ways to uh, reduce that 17% tax uh, so that there's no tax on the death of the last one of a couple or the death of an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, so the downsizer rule could be used for that. Uh, we also uh, use the downsizer rule for 
people that uh, want to use some of their super when they find a property and they haven't sold the residence yet, they might use the super to put a deposit down. And then when they sell their original property, top their super back up again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very useful. There are proposed changes to the age to, to allow people from 60 and up to make a downsizer. It's currently 65, isn't it? Currently 65, that's right. Uh, so it was intended that for people 65 and over who now have time to think about uh, where they want to live in retirement, but they don't meet a work test, it was intended that they now can put money into super because that's an, a nice vehicle where there's no tax, it pays a regular income stream, uh, and it's easy to operate and get access to a whole range of investments. But uh, there are, um, I guess, with the people downsizing prior to that, uh, there is talk about letting 60 pluses uh, use the mm. downsizer rule. Mm. Uh, why would they need that? Well, it means that they can use the non-concessional cap and the downsizer cap. Mm. Um, so uh, just giving them the ability to put more in mm. uh, and get set up for retirement. Yeah, and like the word is a little bit deceptive because you do not have the downsides as such. You can actually sell the property, put the money into super and buy a much more expensive property if you wish, didn't you, if you had plenty of capital there? So you certainly can. Downsize them. Spouse contributions, they are quite, um, yeah, popular, aren't they? How do they work, Sonia? Uh, so for those people that uh, are working and get a tax bill uh, or uh, have tax taken out of their salary, they may be able to get some of that tax back through a, a spouse rebate by putting money in for their, their spouse. Now, your spouse either has to be under 67 or if they're 67 to 75, they have to meet a work test. Uh, but if you put in up, up to $3,000, you can get uh, a rebate of $540. So it's an 18% rebate and 540 is the maximum you can get. But it, you know, if you're walking down the street and you see 540 on the pavement, you'd pick it up. So yeah. it's a, also a way to build up your spouse's super um, effect, tax effectively. And of course, consolidation just means rolling different supers in together. Um, you can access your super. And this is, I suppose, um, people who may want to pay off debt um, they can access it taking lump sums. Um, people may take lump sums for a variety of reasons. Uh, alternatively, you could start an income stream where you put it into a wallet as it's pictured there and you feed the money back to yourself in the form of some sort of pension. So um, we look at super accounts where you're contributing up into super it's growing your money's going into your super account your pension is like a tap where you start to turn the tap on and return money to yourself um, pensions of course are very very attractive they um, allow you to not only have regular income but also to have lump sum withdrawals if you please and earnings are tax free. Um, let me see what the allocated pension, you know, that's what we've just been um, talking about. I suppose the 58 to 60, uh, there's a little bit of tax consequence that you have to think about there, don't you, Sonia, compared with over 60 where pension payments are tax free. Mm. Um, and also the fact that in withdrawing from a pension, the government does set age-based regulated minimums that you are required to take. But um, you're not obliged to start a pension at any stage in your life. And if you wish to leave your money in super forever, you could. That's correct, isn't it? And some people may decide to do that for quite a length of time if, if they don't have the need to draw the money down and take money out of the system. Um, I suppose they've got to weigh that up against the benefit that they get 
by having money in the tax-free environment of the pension. Mm -hmm. um, the moment the withdrawals normally age-based going from 4 to 14%, uh, at the moment, we've got the COVID relief where the government has said we'll make those minimums half of what they are legitimately on an age basis so that they can leave money into uh, if, if it's not required. Uh, there's no maximum. So with an allocated pension, of course, you have complete access. If needed, it could be all withdrawn. The only thing with access you have to be careful because uh, after a certain age, uh, it may not be possible to get money back into super other than on, say, a downsizer. Um, retired choice is, is our common name for the allocated pension where people make their own investment decisions. They choose how the money will be invested. Uh, we also have another product which we call Retire Smart. And Sonia, could you just go through the, um, oh, sorry, the retired choice investment options are our 13 investment options or any combination thereof. How does that differ from the Retire Smart, Sonia? Uh, Retire Smart uh, does not offer choice at this point in time. So mm -hmm. it's not going to suit everybody, but uh, it does automate uh, what we call a cash bucket strategy. Uh, so it has one growth option, one cash bucket, and you have about two years worth of pension payments in your cash bucket. And that's uh, where the pension payments come out of. So when you, uh, your units are being redeemed to pay the pension, you uh, don't have the risk of volatility impacting the pricing of that, those units. If your cash bucket gets low, it gets topped up. Uh, but if it uh, fills up too much, you get reinvested. So that automation is very handy. Uh, the Retire Choice product, that was the first product, uh, does suit more uh, people because of the choices in investments. And we can replicate the cash bucket strategy. But every couple of years, uh, that cash bucket would need to be uh, manually topped up potentially. Uh, so for that reason, because there's an extra step involved, uh, the Retire Smart's being reconfigured and ultimately in, in the next couple of years, we hope it will offer more choice as well. Hmm. What's call. important is that you do actually need to make a choice in Retire, retire Choice. Uh, hmm. There's no default options. So you, you choose from those uh, single asset classes or diversified options. So to, you, you really have to understand your own attitude to risk and your risk profile so that, um, I mean, if, you, if you've never had an understanding or experience with shares, you wouldn't jump straight into um, uh, a full portfolio of shares in, in your pension in, the, in your first year, perhaps, unless no. you're a born optimist. Yeah. Mm. I had someone describe that as like going to the casino the other day. <laughs> 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 that is right. Um, the, uh, so we've gone through that retire smart. Um, one other thing before we go on to the settling aspect is when people are setting up their pension, they uh, let's just go back to the uh, retire choice, for example. Um, you see a picture there of a, a, a couple, and often there are a couple involved um, in the decision to start the pension. And um, the primary pensioner might say, I want to sort our situation out so that if um, I die, the pension can still continue on to you, my partner. And um, we call that a reversionary pension because it continues in pension form to the surviving partner. Sonia, um, at the moment, what happens if the reversionary pensioner dies before the primary pensioner does? You then have a nomination that isn't in effect. Mm -hmm. So it's not valid, right. which means that uh, you need to uh, think about where you want your money to 
to go because otherwise the trustees of the fund are going to have to go through a process to make that decision. Uh, and if there's no nomination on your account, it makes the decision a bit harder and it takes longer for the monies to come out of super to those you want to end up with the money. So having a nomination, whether it's non-binding or binding on your account after that reversion becomes invalid is important. Uh, but there's a process to uh, add that nomination and it involves stopping and restarting your pension. So it requires careful thought as to the pros and cons. Uh, and, and that's something we can talk to individuals about uh, if they're in that situation. Yeah, yeah, because uh, a lot of people do, I suppose, especially in the days of blended marriages and, you know, couples having children here and there, um, one partners uh, taken out of the picture it, it can be quite complicated as far as you know having the reversionary um, status and one partner gone so I suppose um, yeah well worth some thought and probably discussion when you're setting up the pension in the early days yes um, I still see people nominate their their children and for part of the benefit but uh, being aware of that, that your spouse will get all the money tax free even if it stays in super it's still tax free if they draw lump sums or um, uh, put it on the they don't have to put on the tax return so therefore um, yeah, the spouse often makes sense in the first instance for the recipient and if the reversionary pensioner dies the the um, individual could roll the money back as you say and commence a new pension where they can put a new nomination on and nominate their children as such or whoever they want to, yes. um, if they exist. Uh, you mentioned there may be complications and I think you're referring back to pensions that were started prior to um, 1 January 2015 uh, for Centrelink recipients at that time. Um, yes, there's some, some special rules around grandfathering, uh, but usually if a spouse dies, your Centrelink uh, equations all thrown up in the air and um, where it settles would still uh, be different. So yes. maybe the grand losing the grandfathering is the least of your worries. Yes, and a lot of people, um, you know, they're starting with they had to have those two conditions fulfilled. May the 1st of January 2015, they had to have had the pension in existence and Centrelink benefits coming to them at the same time. So That's right. It's becoming more and more rare for those sort of people to be um, worrying about their pension changing, I suppose. Same rule would apply if they moved out to another pension product in another fund. That is a new product. Um, it stops the old treatment for Centrelink purposes as well. Correct. And for some people to lose the old treatment and go on to deeming actually puts them in a better position. Well, well Which, investigating, isn't it? I'm getting it is. the advice for it. Yeah. Um, okay, we've done a little bit of that. We're going to go on to Centrelink. Um, Sonia, you're an expert on this and I um, am not. <laughs> so I'll um, let you take the floor here and um, uh, we'll just go through a few of these aspects of the pension. <laughs> yes, so the criteria list includes age and slowly over time, the age is creeping up to 67, but it will depend on your uh, date of birth. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about what their age pension age is, uh, we're happy to answer that, or there's good information available on the Centrelink website. We've got it here. Yeah. Oh, there we go, there we go. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that uh, was 65, uh, but you can see that it's crept up to 66. Um, the other criteria include residency. So if you've been here 10 years or more, uh, that will tick the box. If you're from somewhere like New Zealand where we have uh, an agreement uh, with social security, uh, there, there could be some other ways uh, if you haven't lived here 10 years. Um, so, so Centrelink are happy to address those issues. Uh, Assets and income then are assessed. So we have two tests under the means testing and they're run simultaneously. And whichever test gives you the lowest age pension uh, is the one that they'll apply. And that's mean, 
that's why they call it means testing. But <laughs> it's the way our system works. Uh, and it's to make sure everybody gets fair treatment. Uh, if somebody is eligible, though, I like to see them uh, claim that because you, if you've contributed tax over the years, uh, it's good to get some of that tax money back. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the concession card that comes with the age pension as well uh, makes it even more worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And that picture there, um, inside the assets there is a property. Um, the principal residence essentially is exempt, isn't it, regardless of the value of the property? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It is for now. There's been talk about changing that, but mm -hmm. it's not popular. Um, mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's not going to be raised again for a while. No, no. Um, so uh, the ages at the moment, um, and it will go out to 67 um, by one July 2023, with the trend going even towards 70, perhaps, um, as the population's ageing. Which These, is hard for people in some industries. If you're a builder doing physical work, uh, mm -hmm. that extra couple of years is, is, is hard to adjust to. But it means it's even more important to be able to self-fund for the period from retirement to age pension age. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, the asset test, you talked about those two tests, Sonia. Asset test here, um, showing the single homeowner um, gaining a full pension if their counted assets for settling purposes are under 588,250. They give a little bit um, of leeway for a person, the single person, who doesn't own their home, they can have assets up to 804,750 because uh, and and get some pension because they've got to pay rent, of course, and got to find somewhere to live. Um, you can see the full pensioner um, levels for the homeowner, 270,500, the non-homeowner up to 487,500. Um, I suppose, you know, you've got to weigh up. There's um, not many houses these days left, you know, for a couple of hundred thousand, uh, which is the difference there in assets. The income uh, on this slide, you can see for a couple of homeowner. Oh, sorry, these are the asset tests. Uh, the um, uh, couples get a um, part pension if their homeowner's up to 884,000, non-homeowner up to 1,100,500, um, where the pension would cut out. Um, income test is a little bit uh, less easy to understand for people, Sonia. Might let you go through with that one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, given that assets uh, don't include your home, what do they include? They include financial assets, uh, your car and contents of your house, uh, coin collections, artwork, those sorts of things. Uh, the income then includes not only what you earn, but deemed income on the financial assets. And the deeming rates uh, have come down due to COVID, fortunately. Uh, so that the uh, there's two tiers. The first uh, tier uh, for your uh, deeming is uh, 53,000 for an individual and 88,000 approximately for a couple. And that's only deemed to earn 0.25%. The uh, assets above that are deemed to earn 2.25%. So uh, whilst that's a little bit higher than what you can get if you have cash or term deposits, if you have money in super earning seven to 10%, uh, you're well ahead by having deeming. Uh, the deeming rates are quite generous. Uh, if you have uh, an investment property, the rent will count towards the income test. Uh, if you have one of those old defined benefit pensions, there'll be a component uh, count towards the income test as well. But it would be fair to say most people are under the asset test when it comes to Centrelink deeming. Now, another important 
I think when it comes to Centrelink assessment. But yeah. with, with your income test, uh, once you get to age pension age, uh, the first $300 of earned income is not uh, included in the test. And if you don't use that $300 in a fortnight, you can bank it up and carry forward uh, about $6,000 um, to uh, use in a, a subsequent fortnight. And then uh, there's strategy around then using that and um, making the most of your Centrelink benefits. Mm. So that is, that, that's called the work bonus? That is called the work bonus, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, for people in education, I suppose, they might get the odd contract here or there. Uh, they may be on some Centrelink, but, you know, it may be useful to bank up that bonus, uh, especially if they're going to get the contract towards the end of the financial year. Um, it might only be working one or two days a week. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they can still get a generous age pension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing, Zilla, if we go back to the uh, asset test for couples, mm -hmm. uh, those upper thresholds, um, whilst they're high, uh, there's a lot of people still have assets more than that, mm -hmm. but not much more than that. So there are some strategies we can use to reduce assets mm -hmm. if, if getting Centrelink is a priority. We can look at things like funeral bonds. You can have up to three and thirteen thousand five hundred in a funeral bond, and it's not uh, accessible. You can have annuities, which are um, assessed uh, depending on the type of annuity. But there's products out there where only sixty percent of the uh, amount you invest is counted as an asset. So, uh, if at the same time you have a longevity risk, perhaps you can also get more age pension by investing some of your money in an annuity. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think uh, in addition to that, uh, we also look at any age differential. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got an older spouse that is reaching age, pension age, um, a couple of years before a younger spouse, we can actually move money from the older spouse into the younger spouse's name. And if the younger spouse keeps that money in accumulation phase, it will be an exempt asset as well. So certainly don't see it as couple income if it's in the um, younger spouse no. super accumulation account. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it hiding the super uh, mm -hmm. in the spouse's name or hiding in, in the money from investments outside, putting it in the younger spouse's name inside mm -hmm. super. But Centrelink uh, fully endorsed this strategy mm -hmm. and even suggested well, it to well, people yeah. as well. So uh, eventually the younger spouse is going to get to age pension age. Uh, and then that falls away potentially. But, um, you know, for the meantime, if that older spouse can get the age pension, which uh, the half share is about 18,000 per annum, that's $18,000 of your own money that you don't have to spend. Hmm. So I suppose it's got a lot of implications. You've got to think in terms of um, is the younger spouse still working? What income are they getting? Like it's a yes. total equation, isn't it? To see yes. Whether they have would get Centrelink anyway. Yes, yeah. and what are they giving up? If they have to put their money in accumulation phase and can't get the tax savings on yeah. earnings in a pension, uh, mm -hmm. it might be a borderline benefit, but often, often um, you know, people could benefit from that age arbitrage. Yeah. I suppose there's a lot of trust in that too, because <laughs> your uh, assets go towards the same amount of money. Oh, I, I think as far as... Um, the eyes of the law, what's yeah. uh, theirs is yours. It's yeah. all it put into the mix anyway. If something's yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, Centrelink age pension rates, they, they are there. Um, the single pensioner getting 24,770 for a full pension. Um, the maximum for a couple is uh, 37,341. And then there's a slightly uh, different arrangement for couples who are Centrelink recipients, but are separated due to ill health. So one partner may be in a home or whatever, um, can't live together. It's not because they're separated because they're sick of each other. We did have, <laughs> <laughs> we did have that just to say, but you know. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, you talked before about people 
often um, strategising just to get a dollar of pension. And no doubt you're referring to the concessions and the concession card that Centrelink Pension provides to people. Um, if they can't get that, they often can uh, apply for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. And Sonia, can you just go through a little bit about this? Uh, thanks, Ella. The, the age is the same. You have to get to age pension age. Mm -hmm. You have to meet the residency rules as well. Mm -hmm. At this time, there's no asset test. There's only an income test. And, and the amounts are given there. So for a single person, uh, that 55,000 would include your earned income and deemed income on your financial investments. For the couple, it's going to include your income and your spouse's income and deemed income. But if, uh, as a rule of thumb, for people that aren't working, uh, you need $3 million in assets before you're not eligible, uh, simply because the de deeming rates are so generous. Uh, mm -hmm. So if it means that you can get cheaper pharmaceuticals, uh, bulk billing at the doctors, if your doctor allows it, not all do, mm. but uh, mm. yours may. Uh, and some uh, councils actually still give you the discounts on rates. Uh, mm. Some utilities still give you the discounts because you've got this Commonwealth Seniors Health Card. Mm. Mm. No, it's um, very popular and... They say about um, would it be eighty five percent of the community as they age would probably be entitled to the um, Centrelink Senior Health Card. Mm. Mm. I had did have somebody knocked back the other day, but uh, when they showed me their submission, they'd filled in a couple of fields wrong. So Centrelink mm. can tend to knock people back without saying, "Oh, by the way, uh, we note there's an error." They'll just find an excuse. So if anybody needs their their forms checked, we're happy to do that for them. Oh, thanks, Anna. Um, also, I suppose if you don't um, satisfy that, there are some benefits in getting older and that you can often get a seniors card and um, uh, sometimes your state or territory senior cards give you uh, discounts on um, buses and things like that. So uh, it depends, like if you've got, um, you get to a certain age, you can apply for the seniors business card and you can still get a free coffee uh, at McDonald's, as I say, if you buy <laughs> some food. <laughs> Not that I've it tried all, it. It all counts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it is a benefit um, to getting older. Uh, estate planning. Uh, Sonia, you have a lot of clients that you, um, you go through their um, different uh, goals and needs and uh, situations. So um, I think understated with that is that every uh, everyone over 18 should have a will in place and a legitimate will. But 50% of Australia do Probably don't. Probably don't. They don't. No. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. So the rules of intestacy are complicated and uh, not necessarily going to send your assets where you want them to go. Okay. Mm. And, and it can be very costly to uh, sort things out. Yes. As can yes. an invalid will. Mm -hmm. I've recently had a lady, she's got a will kit. Uh, the witnesses have um, signed off, but they signed off on a different date. So it still had mm -hmm. to go to court. So she's trying to access money from her late husband's accounts and can't. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could take one or two years to sort through. Yeah. Uh, so whilst we're not estate planning solicitors and what we do identifying uh, people's wishes is very important because it will impact nominations on super and uh, I think uh, having people uh, have that peace of mind as well um, mm -hmm. is an important they, part. I suppose they want to look at their situation holistically and have the money go and be distributed as tax effectively as possible, according to the wishes as well. So yes. the, the advice especially is, is valid and um, needed in many people's cases, yeah. And what we do know is that superannuation uh, doesn't necessarily form part of your estate. So your Correct. will may not even cover it. Mm. Uh, your nomination can have the super go direct to the people you want and it bypasses the will. And there's other investments that have similar um, 
features and uh, we're helping people set those investments up because they might want to protect assets from former spouses or from their children's former spouses or uh, where they're separating or maybe they want to keep money in the family for uh, the next generation so that's where estate planning is so important uh, we don't offer a will service ourselves but we work closely uh, with some solicitors that we can recommend to people that give members of the fund a discount on the service and all they're doing is uh, estate planning so they're very quick and efficient at what they do uh, and very knowledgeable as far as nominating the beneficiaries if we take it back to super we have a situation in our fund where you can make a binding death nomination which is legally binding on the trustee um, if you just had a nomination of beneficiaries that was not binding, um, who makes the decision there, Sonia, as to how it proceeds? The trustees of the fund, uh, because they're, they're holding the money beneficially for you, but the decision rests with them in that instance. Uh, so they have to be very careful that the money ends up in the right place. Uh, so it could be a long process. Uh, ultimately, though, if, if you've made a non-binding nomination, uh, they'll take that into account, but they'll also want to see your will and uh, see who's got what claim to your monies. So uh, a binding nomination uh, removes the discretion from the trustees mm -hmm. and, and they have to follow your wishes, which yeah. is great if, if your wishes are still appropriate, but uh, perhaps there's some complications in your situation where you know one of your children might be going through bankruptcy and you don't want the binding nomination to lock in a payment to them because they're not going to get it anyway mm -hmm. uh, in which case there's other thing other options yeah and with the binding death nomination you can always do a new one and you sure can yeah. And that's part of the benefit of it lapsing every three years. It gives you a, a, another opportunity to, to ask yourself, is this still appropriate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a good facility. Um, aged care, you uh, do, do advice on aged care. Um, we have seminars and things like that where... Um, members uh, can gain more information and knowledge. It's quite a complicated area, isn't it, aged care? It certainly mm -hmm. is. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason why we've all become accredited in aged care is because you, you can't ignore the impact uh, it has on planning and doing uh, any aged care um, advice or investigation uh, means that we can add value to people if they do uh, do things in the right order so depending on your needs uh, whether one person in a couple needs to go into care or whether two people need to go into care it could change our advice uh, quite dramatically and people wonder you know how much is it going to cost where do I get the money from uh, so there's different arrangements that could actually uh, mean that you're better off overall uh, you can meet the cash flow needs to pay for the accommodation and perhaps still keep the home uh, for the remaining spouse without having to sell it. So uh, it's very important to do things in the right order though. Uh, families often have to make decisions very quickly uh, when something happens to mum or dad. So knowing that uh, they can come and see us and get that help um, and when everything else is overwhelming uh, is important. Mm -hmm. But we, we only have the one slide here. There's much mm -hmm. more we can go into in a separate yeah. Seminar. Okay. Mm, very good. Um, how can a player assist? You can answer this one, Sonia. <laughs> uh, in more ways than people think. Uh, there's, uh, yes, the first point: save money on, save your money for retirement. Uh, absolutely, we can help you build up your retirement savings. We can help you maximise Centrelink. Uh, we can show you how long your money will last in retirement. Uh, that's through projections. We can also do different projections to say, what if you go one way or the other? Uh, but other examples could be uh, helping people uh, with disabilities uh, claim and manage their insurance proceeds and uh, set up an income stream. 
or it could be uh, helping a young person set up an investment portfolio with their surplus cash outside super, or it could be helping couples uh, equalise their balances or uh, find funding for their home or pay off their debt quicker. Uh, we do look at uh, your goals. It's very important that our advice is goal driven uh, because no two people are the same. Mm -hmm. And as you're implying there, you've got um, tangible, um, touchable, uh, write down on paper the, the value of your advice. Also, intangible elements such as peace of mind, uh, having everything in place feeling comfort, I suppose, and yes. decisions. Hmm. And the legislation actually requires us to, to only provide advice if we're more than likely to put somebody in a better position. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's never outcome-driven. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we have three options here written on the screen. Uh, general advice is general advice and education, such as the facilities that I offer. Um, people in my position as regional managers in the offices, we can go through, explain how um, our vehicles operate, answer questions, um, assist people with, um, you know, if they wanted to start a pension without any advice, do anything where they connected with super that doesn't uh, require or the person doesn't desire any advice input. The other two relate to uh, working under a licence and they are our over-the-phone planners which operate out of headquarters and they will do single topic advice. Is that correct, Sonia? Absolutely. And a little bit on that, um, what they'll do advice on. And, and this is at no additional cost. It's a benefit of our membership of the fund. If you can just um, elaborate on what sort of topics they'll do advice on. If you want help with insurances or salary sacrificing uh, or starting a pension or um, uh, investments, uh, I did say investment choice, didn't I? Uh, those single topics uh, mm -hmm. can be uh, looked at Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're doing comprehensive, that's what you would do and you'd look at the person's total and a couple's total circumstances and um, address your planning towards their goals. And often, I suppose, part of the uh, investigation um, is discovering the couple or the single person's goals you know, for, for their um retirement for their future yeah not only money I suppose there's different elements of the peace of mind a whole lot isn't there mm -hmm. yes because if you tinker with one part of your uh, finances you might impact other areas so the comprehensive plan looks at that holistic situation uh, the service we offer uh, is a free meeting uh, there's no charge for the first meeting and there's no obligation to get advice it's simply a process to see if we can help you. And we'd be honest if we couldn't. Uh, sometimes the timing's not right. We'll say come back in 12 months. Uh, but if we can help you, we would let you know what areas they are and the fixed price quote in that meeting. Uh, importantly, I, I've worked in uh, private practice, so I know the fees here are very, very reasonable. Uh, and certainly if, if that advice is putting you in a better position, uh, the fees more than pay for themselves. Uh, for those who are wondering, well, you know, could I afford them? Uh, there's a component of that fee could possibly come out of super as well. So in that first meeting, we can talk about all those things. Mm -hmm. um, we do webinars, we do Centrelink webinars, we do aged care, we do these sort of retirement plannings and, and the like. Um, now, the member portal. Member portal is very popular with our members, of course. You can go into the portal. Um, if you've never been in before, you go to our homepage and you look at where uh, it says log in. If you've never logged in before, it'll drive you to put uh, your registration where you'll put your client ID and you'll set a password and then you can go in forevermore. You can save that if you like and regularly go in and look at uh, different aspects of your account. 
Uh, you can look at your investment, your insurance. There's a number of things you can do online. The member portal is a very attractive aspect of the super fund, very useful. Um, you know, even to the stage now where you can initiate uh, increases in insurance, you can actually uh, start an insurance claim if needed and the like. So um, I'd implore every member to have a look at the facility um, and they can look on a regular basis at, at how their super is doing um, and their account basis and, and contributions and the like. Mm -hmm. So member portal is, is a terrific benefit. With the um, pension account too, Zilla, they can uh, alter their pension payments now online or we'll take a lump sum of up to 20000 using the portal. Yeah, just from the portal without, um, without yeah, having to drop into the office. Yeah, terrific. Um, our contacts are there. Um, the 1300 number is our call centre number. We've got local offices, of course, in many places throughout Australia. You can email us at any time. Um, we've got the website, which has an abundance of up-to-date information. Uh, you can email fund office if you can't um, access your regional office for some particular reason. Um, if you want to get in contact, say, with Sonia and, you know, I'm here, you can <laughs> send me an email, what Sonia's contacts or whatever, um, and, and we can put things in place. But uh, I think that virtually concludes the formal part of the webinar. And um, now we might go into um, some chat questions perhaps. Got two um, very helpful attendees in the background, um, literally, <laughs> who, who might um, put some chat questions up and we can have a look at it. Or um, I don't, I'm not great at technology, so uh, Paul might even help with uh, putting the question out there. Okay, thanks, Zilla. Um, I just thought I'd let you know you were very modest and very kind to me. I was wondering what sort of an introduction I was going to get then. Um, <laughs> I was going to say young fellas. <laughs> it's all no, relative. I would have been happy with that. Um, um, Sal, uh, Sonia, I was going to call you Sally then. Sonia, um, has the legislation been passed to raise the eligibility for the bring forward provision to 67? It has been passed, yes. That was very good news right at the end of the last financial year, but uh, it has come into force. Yeah, lovely. And I'm presuming then that you can then use and make a, um, like do put in a $330,000 contribution right at or before turning age 67? Yes, or uh, even if you're 66 on the 1st of July and you've turned 67 in that year, you can make the contribution before the 30th of June, provided uh, if you're 67, uh, you've met the work test that year. Yeah, lovely. So there's some nuances. If anybody's uncertain, we're happy to help look at their situation. Yeah, for sure. Um, just by the way, we have a number of questions, so we're possibly not going to get through all of these tonight. So I would say that the, the local regional manager to where these people have asked these questions, they'll reach out, make contact, um, either by phone or by email to answer these questions or see if you've got any more. Um, the one thing, there's another question here is, is that can you make the downsize a contribution only once? Yes, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's not an easy thing to, to live in a house for 10 years and then have another 10 years in another house. But uh, I guess it's possible, but uh, no, it's only available once at this stage. Lovely. Um, I'd also remind people is, is that after the, um, the session tonight, there'll also be a survey sent out um, where you can also indicate if you do want to receive further information from the fund as well. Um, there was a question there in regards of when can I access the transition to retirement pension? Once you've turned preservation age. Lovely. So it could be 58, could be 59, could be 60. So depending on their year of birth. 
Yes. Lovely. Um, I suppose that you mentioned about the um, accessing the, you know, the additional contributions to go over the threshold of 27,500. Mm -hmm. um, how do you actually notify your employee that you wish to go over that? Uh, roll forward, yeah, the bring the, the bring, carry forward concessional, the carry forward concessional yeah. contributions, yes. I would say your employer wants nothing to do with knowing anything about what you're doing with the cap. Mm -hmm. You just tell them the amount or the percentage and they should action it. Yeah. So they will take no responsibility because imagine the risk of them having to individually calculate yeah, exactly. hundreds of caps that they won't take responsibility. So uh, that's where, uh, yes, you, you are in the driving seat uh, by yeah. filling in the form. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure employers will allow people. They just need to fill out the form and just make a check and maybe even do a phone call. Um, there was another question there um, that I don't know whether you will be able to answer. Um, if I have an investment property and to obviously in today's in environment with low interest rates um, and that this property is now, I suppose you could be classed as neutrally geared, is it a good idea to increase salary sacrificing? Oh, uh, the answer to that is it depends. Uh, there's too many combinations and permutations, to, but but it's a good thought to, to if you to start down that track, uh, then have a look at um, your age, uh, the interest rate on that mortgage, uh, what your capital requirements are. There's so many things come into play because uh, superannuation is a great vehicle, but what if you, you put more money into super and it's preserved and you're only young? So we, uh, have a look at the everything in context. Yeah. Mm. Lovely. Um, one for you, Zilla. Yep. Um, how do I check if I've got a current binding nomination? Um, you can ring you can ring us for a start. You could ring your regional manager who can easily um, do a report for you on your account at any time. Uh, email it back to you and it'll show you a nomination when it expires. Uh, you can call and um, check. Yeah. There I, is I think a, um, it just should show on we've added, It's on the portal as the well. Portal, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just as a, um, as a bit of a heads up, annual statements are coming out in the coming um, weeks. Um, and in there, it will either have binding or non-binding as mm. well. So, yep. Anne Marie, if that answers your question, and it gives um, an expiry too, Paul, doesn't it? The when it will expire because ours last three years, and yeah, correct, That's correct, good. yeah. Um, do we have a service for making a will? No, we're not lawyers. Yeah. No, so. Um, Sonia, I know that there was a, a period of time where there was um, a will making service available to members. Do you have any details or do you just tell to, to suss out or do a shop around for solicitors or, or uh, how do we, how do they get assistance in making a will? Uh, so uh, I guess I, I talk to people a lot about what their needs are for a very simple will, um, depends on the state as well. I know we've got the public trustee trustee here in Queensland that will do a free will. But uh, all around the country, we have a referral partner that uh, gives members a discount for preparing wills. So they will charge a small fee for the first meeting, which offsets against the cost of the will if you go ahead. And they're really good value. Um, I hesitate to say their name on uh, the webinar. Uh, I think I'd be allowed to say it, but I'm just not 100% sure. So if people want me to send an email, uh, if you leave your email address, uh, I can send you the, the information on them. Lovely. Thanks, Sonia. Um, we've probably only got time for two more. Um, and they're in regards to financial advice. So what are the costs of financial advice if you've already used up your free appointment? Uh, so we would call the next appointment a review meeting and uh, that enables us uh, it's a small fee of $380 where we go back through your file and see uh, what the notes said from the first meeting and we get your information ready uh, for when you come in uh, but there's no obligation to get any further advice from that meeting you might just need general advice in that review meeting and uh, it, that fee can come out of your super as well 
Lovely. Um, so we've got a situation here where a person has already received advice um, and it was last year and now they're wanting to look at um, getting further advice is that they are actually retiring at the end of the year. So do you need to pay another fee and then do you need to use the same representative? No, absolutely. Uh, of course, um, you can have a team uh, around the country that can provide advice so you can use another representative. Uh, the fee would be subject to what you need um, done in, in terms of advice. Uh, so it's fee for service uh, based on the components. A small, if you only need a couple of things done, it's a small fee, um, but it builds up. A, uh, but again, it, it has to be putting you in a better position. So uh, we're not going to do advice for the sake of it either. We're not on commissions at any level. Um, so we uh, just uh, look at what's in your best interest. Lovely. Um, that's all we've probably got time for. I will um, um, I will state for the people that we haven't got to in terms of the questions, um, we will be sending an email or getting a local regional manager to give you a call as well. I would note there, Sonia, that someone has asked for those solicitors' details, so I'll pass that on so that Wonderful. you can send that through. Mm -hmm. Okay, over for you, Zilla. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, for attending. Um, if you would be happy to fill in that survey, it would be gratefully received. Uh, over the next day or so, or even do it now if you've got a few minutes to do it. Um, uh, and um, if you've got any general queries at any time or you want to have something explained in more detail, you can feel free to call or email. Uh, I'm happy to answer general questions at any time. If you want to be in contact or have an advice appointment, you can contact me to put you in contact with um, setting up. Sonia comes to North Queensland regularly for um, visits and she has the free appointment facility um, in the first instance. So um, you're welcome to contact me if you want um, me to be a go-between with Sonia's services. But otherwise, thanks very much for your attendance today and um, happy to hear from you at any time as we always are. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too.